Hello, this is Rochelle Gatha, and this is the lecture for relevant cost for short-term disabilities in managerial accounting. The first objective is to describe and identify information relevant to short-term business decisions. And there's a lot in this chapter, so I'm going to speak rather quickly, but feel free to listen to it more than one time and print the slides out. How do managers make decisions? They define business goals. They identify alternative courses of action. They gather and analyze relevant information, choose the best alternative, and implement the best alternative. Then they follow up to compare actual with anticipated results. So this is your basic framework for management decisions from a textbook standpoint. Relevant and irrelevant information. Relevant is your expected future cost and revenue data. That's relevant to the decision. It differs among alternative courses of action is both quantitative and qualitative. Then there's irrelevant data, costs that do not differ between alternatives, sunk costs, which is incurred in the past and cannot be changed. There's many irrelevant data sources, but these are the main ones that we're going to talk about. Relevant non-financial information. Non-financial or qualitative factors also play a role in a manager's decision. Things such as laying off employees, outsourcing, reduced control over delivery time and product quality, discounted prices to select customers, and then managers who ignore qualitative factors can make serious mistakes. So it's not all about the numbers. It really is about knowing your business, and a good manager knows their business and knows their numbers, and those kind of good managers are hard to find. Six short-term special decisions. So if you're going to make a special decision, that is around a special sales order. It's pricing, discontinuing products, departments, and stores, product mix, outsourcing, and selling as is or processing further. So these are um, what we would call special decisions. Keys to making short-term special decisions. There's a decisions approach where you look at relevant information, the relevant information approach, or the incremental analysis approach. Two keys in analyzing short-term special business decisions are focus on relevant revenues, costs, and profits, and use contribution margin approach that separates variable costs from fixed costs. Sustainability in short-term business decisions are where we view every decision as having an impact on the people, the planet, and the profitability. Timberland, doing well and doing good, there's an example in the book about the employees given PTO to volunteer, so go ahead and check that one out and it can be costly. Objective two is to decide whether to accept a special order. Okay, we're back kind of in the manufacturing world here, more so than the service industry. But if a customer requests a one-time order at a reduced sale price, often for a large quantity. So you have these decision rules. Do we have excess capacity available to fill the order? If yes, then you consider it. If no, then you reject it. Because if you don't have capacity, then you can't do it. And capacity is a big word. It, it can be your uh, manufacturing plant, your building space, your people. Capacity means a lot of things. Decision rule two, is the special reduced sales price high enough to cover the incremental cost of filling the order? If the revenues are greater than the cost, then accept the order. This is assuming the first slide is true. If the revenues are less than expected, then no, you're not going to do it, because why would you take a special order if it costs you more than the money that you make? Will the special order affect regular sales in the long run? If no, then accept the special order. If yes, then reject the special order. And you have to understand, I guess if you really step back, if you're going to take a special order one time that's going to bring more business to your business, that might be a reason to look at this a little differently, but we're talking about a basic textbook um, discussion of these special orders. Here's an incremental analysis of special orders from Exhibit 8-6. So here's your increase in your revenue, your expected increase in expenses, and here's your increase in operating income. So it makes sense to take the special order on a very simple case. Now let's look at E816A. Here they wanted you to prepare an incremental analysis to determine whether the, this collectible card should accept special orders. So they give you the variable cost per unit, and it is materials, labor, and overhead, so it's 30 cents. And then would, this company would accept the special order because the cost per part to make is only 30 cents, and they're giving you 40 cents per part to sell. So here it is on a unit level. So go back and look at E816A and make sure this makes sense to you on a unit level. 
Now assume that Hall of Fame wants special hologram baseball cards. So in this instance, um, you must spend $5,000 to develop the hologram. So here's your increase in sales, the $0.40 cents times the 57,000 cards, but then you have an additional fixed cost of $5,000. So now you're down to $700 in operating income. So the question then for me would be, are you going to do more of these for them ongoing, or is this a one-time thing never to see them again? Objective three is to describe and apply different approaches to pricing. Regular pricing considerations is what is our target profit. Companies create targets, so that is a target profit. How much will customers pay? Are we a price taker or a price setter? So let's talk about what a price taker is. A product lacks a uniqueness, it has heavy competition, and the pricing approach emphasizes target costing. So you take what you can get basically in this situation. You sell basic jeans, everybody has basic jeans, and you know that it, you're a price taker. A price setter is the product is more unique, less competition, the pricing approach emphasizes cost plus pricing. Okay, so if you have children and you know they want those lucky brand jeans that cost $200, you, you don't really know why, but for some reason it's a unique product and there's less competition for it, so it's a they are a price setter. Target costing exhibit 8-9. Market price minus desired profit is target cost. So look at these words. Your market price, what you can get in the market, minus what you, you want as a profit is your target cost. It is not break even. Target cost includes all of these items. So you have to cover them all and know that you're covering them all. So here's your calculation of your revenue at market price at these units times three dollars less your desired profit means your target cost is six fifty. Two potential outcomes when using target costing. The actual cost less the target cost total cost. The actual cost greater than the target total cost. And some other strategies. You could increase sales, so you use the CVP analysis to compute target sales to achieve its target profit, so you're incorporating back the um, CVP analysis we learned in a prior chapter. Change your ad to its product mix, so this is something that you might consider with this strategy. Offer levels of the same product. Offer new items to the product mix with high contribution margin. Remove items with low contribution margin, so you're going to think about this as you're looking at your strategies. Differentiate your products. Make it unique. Branding, quality, service packs. So these are other strategies that you're going to look at. Cost plus pricing. Okay, here is the opposite of target pricing. You know your cost and you add the desired profit. And most managers understand this more than the other slides just because it, it's, um, I guess it just makes more sense if you're not an analytical person. Here's a calculation of a cost plus price. So you start with your variable cost plus your fixed cost, add your desired profit, there's your target revenue divided by the number of units, so you must sell it at 3.2 to get that desired profit. Here's your decision rules, how to approach pricing. If the company is a price taker, then it emphasizes target costing. If the company is a price setter, you can emphasize cost plus price um, pricing approach. Let's look at E8-19A. Okay, so in the scenario that they give you, it's a custom builder. And they're asking you which approach to price would the Smith builders emphasize and why. So they talk about target costing. The firm is a price taker. The product lacks uniqueness and there is heavy competition. Okay, they build track homes, so that makes sense. Will Smith Builders be able to achieve its target profit levels? They want you to show the, the calculations. So here's your revenue at market price, less your desired profit, which is the 14% of the variable cost, is your target cost right here. The answer is no, because the target cost is less than the variable cost. Okay, so go back into the um, book and you see the different costs that are in there and this number is actually um, less, so you're not going to make it. If Smith Builders upgrades, what will the new cost plus price per home be should the company differentiate its products? So here's your current cost plus your desired profit 
is your cost plus price. Yes, they should customize because they will achieve their target profit levels with the cost plus price. Okay, so they give you the 190 and then they give you the 18,000 as the additional upgrades. Objective four, decide whether to discontinue a product or department store. Other short-term business decisions managers face. When to discontinue a product, a department, or a store even. And we saw this a lot through the economy of the 2007s through even current. Stores went out of business. Stores like Mervyn's disappeared and you wondered how Kohl's made it and Mervyn's didn't. How to factor constrained resources into product mix decisions. When to make a product or outsource it when to sell as is or process further. Here's a consideration for discontinuing products. So you have a, a oil filters and air cleaners and you come on down and you get to the operating income at the bottom and the oil filters are making money and the air cleaners aren't. Does the product provide positive contribution margin? That's the first question. Yes? No. Considerations for discontinuing products in a department or a store. Will the total fixed cost continue to exist even if the product line is discontinued and that that's something you really have to think about because when you create all of the back end to build a product or a store that that back end cost is there forever so I um, mean you depreciate it over a certain period of time can any direct fixed cost of the product be avoided if the product line is discontinued can any direct fixed cost of the product be avoided if the product line is discontinued that, they bought that on there twice. Sorry about that. Use incremental analysis for discontinuing a product. Okay, so these are the analysis we're going to do next. Decision rule. Discontinue a product, department, or store. And discontinuing an entire store is a large decision as opposed to just one product, but the, the thought process is the same. If your lost revenues from discontinuation exceed the cost savings, then don't discontinue. If, on the other side, if, it, if they do exceed, then discontinue. Let's look at E820A. Prepare an incremental analysis to show whether this Entertainment Plus should discontinue the DVD product line. We'll discontinue DVDs at 18000 to operating income. So they give you the sale of DVDs, they give you the variable manufacturing expenses, and this is the expected decrease in operating income. Assume that the Entertainment Plus can avoid 20000 of fixed expenses by discontinuing the DVD product line. Okay, so now you have your sale of the DVDs, your variable, your fixed, and now you get expected decrease in operating income. Okay, you're still sitting there at a decrease. Now assume that all 68,000 of fixed costs can be eliminated. So here's your sales, and then you have 86,000 of variable expenses, and you have 68,000 of direct expenses um, relating to the Blu-ray. So you get expected decrease in total expenses and you get expected increase in operating income. So in this situation, it looks a lot different. And how do you know what direct fixed expenses you can eliminate? And that's a, that's a really um, large analysis on the back end. Like I mentioned, you have to understand what your fixed costs are to know if you truly are going to eliminate fixed costs if you eliminate a product line. Objective five, factor resource constraints into the product mix decisions. Okay, this is an example um, from your book. So they give you the sales price, the variable expenses, there's your contribution margin, this is a review from prior chapters, and then here's your 60% um, is your 18 divided by your 30, then here's your genes example, it ends up with 20%. So here's your product mix considerations, they have different contribution margins, jeans and shirts. So now when you look at the situation times the units, your total contribution margin at full capacity for the two products is jeans is 480 and shirts is 360. So your product mix decision rule is which product to emphasize. Emphasize the product with the highest contribution margin as we just saw on the other slide. Product mix when demand is limited or fixed costs change. What if demand is limited due to competition? In this example, the company has demand for only 30,000 genes, which consume in total 1,500 hours of labor. So here's your example, the contribution margin at full capacity of the genes and the shirts. What if the fixed costs are different when a different product mix is emphasized? Let's go on to the next slide.
So let's do E8-22A. This is Get Fit product mix and analysis. So they have a, a deluxe sales price per unit and a regular. They have variable costs and they have a contribution margin per unit. Then they have the number of machine hours used and they come up with number of machine hours down below. So Get Fit should produce only the regular model because it's much larger um, contribution margin per equivalent number of machine hours. And here's the math down below so you can see it. So this is a really good example of maximizing your product mix. Here's objective six, analyze outsourcing. Outsourcing is a really um, big decision to make. Some companies don't want to outsource, others do it um, very intelligently under these assumptions to buy a product or service a product in-house. The heart of the decision is how best to use available resources. How do your variable costs compare to the outsourcing cost? Are any fixed costs available avoidable if we outsource? What could we do with the freed capacity? These are all things that you have to think about. Should the company outsource? If the incremental cost of making exceed the incremental cost of outsourcing, then outsource it. And opposite, then don't. This is just your decision rule. Let's look at E8-25A. Here, given the same cost structure, should Opti Systems make or buy a switch? Okay, so here you go where you have make and buy the cost to make versus the cost to buy. Okay, so here is your direct materials, your direct labor, your variable overhead, and it's fifteen fifty per unit. To buy it, it's seventeen. So it costs you more to buy it than to make it. Now assume it can avoid a thousand of fixed costs by outsourcing. So let's look at what this looks like. So here's your fifteen fifty times your seven or versus your seventeen and the number of units you need. Is your, and then you get down to your variable cost, and here's your fixed cost. Notice your fixed costs are 100000 less if you buy, so your total relevant costs here are um, still less under making the switches than buying the switches. Given the last scenario, what is the most OptiSystem would be willing to pay to outsource the switches? Well, let's, this is a little algebra here, so I'm going to put it, put it all up here so you can see it. Okay, so you take your cost of making equals your cost of outsourcing. Variable plus fixed equals variable plus fixed. Here you know all of the scenarios. Here you have an X because you need to, you're trying to find what X will be so that you can break even here. So you do the math and you come up where you can solve for X. And X should be 1680. So if at 1680, then that would be where you'd be willing um, to outsource versus in-house. Objective seven is make sell as is or process further. This, is, this happens a lot in manufacturing. How much revenue is generated if we sell the product as is or if we um, alter it more after needs more processing? How much will the cost to process the product further? Okay, so sell as is scenario is here's your revenue from selling 50,000 quarts of regular olive oil. Process further is you need this gourmet dipping oil, which costs more. So you have 250 of net benefit versus 312 of net benefit. So the additional revenue is 62,500 by having these this special dipping oil. The decision process is sell as is or process further. If the extra revenue exceeds the extra cost, then process it. If not, you have to sell it as is. Let's look at E8-28A. It's just one of these examples where you sell as is, process further adds 50 more cents. So here's your additional process cost per packaging, additional cost process per unit. So you end up with net benefit per unit of 590 under the as is versus 30 cents under the process further. Number of units produced per batch. You get a net benefit per batch here of 35.40 and here 38.40. So it is, in this scenario, it's beneficial because your net benefit per batch is higher. And that's the end of chapter 8. There's a lot in this chapter, so hopefully this gave you enough to attempt your homework. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, thank you.